dans les fibres hein. Good morning. My name is Sue Penny. I am a member of this wonderful Unitarian Universalist congregation of the South Fork. And I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. We also want to extend a warm welcome to the community of Snook, the South Nassau Unitarian Universalist congregation who is joining us this morning uh, from Freeport. I assume most of them are zooming in. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you vote, if good with our principles, wherever you are on your life's journey, whatever your name for the sacred, you are very welcome here. This is a shared ministry. Our minister, the Reverend Kimberly Johnson, uh, continues her sabbatical until June. I think we're doing pretty well and we miss her and glitches happen, but we're getting through them. Um, we are grateful to have with us this morning, the Reverend Linda Anderson. Ah, and first we want to do a land acknowledgement from East Hampton to Riverhead and Shelter Island. We worship and reside on the ancestral lands of the Montaukett, the Shinnecock, the Korchog, and the Manhasset. We honor generations of their care and stewardship with this land and with all the other beings that share this land. And we honor our relationship with our Shinnecock neighbors today in their continued struggles for sovereignty and justice. Now I want to express our gratitude to the Reverend Linda Anderson, who is here with us this morning. Uh, she comes to us with lots of experience and has been the minister at Kingston, New York for 18 years. She's been a chaplain. She's led many workshops uh, on a number of topics, interfaith and UU. Um, one of her specialties is death and grieving. Um, so we are uh, also pleased that she is the um, minister right now at Freeport. Thus, we are having them join us this morning. Uh, we are sharing Linda. Um, and our theme for this month is theological reflection, which is no small topic. And I'm very grateful how Linda embraced this, was inspired by this topic, and is running with it this morning. And we can't believe how we dressed alike even. So um, this kind of a real working together, real collaboration. And a thank you to our musician, Abby Fleming, and our tech host, Carl Wittenberg, Kent Martin, Monica Sasada. Yes, it takes three to do this. Um, and there is a live transcript and closed captioning for those who need it on Zoom. And welcome to all of those coming to us through Zoom. The announcements this morning, um, there's one I'm going to make for you, John Andrews. Do you wanna make it yourself for tonight on the aging? series. Uh, you'll have to come up here, John. You take your mask off. This is part of our uh, series on aging that uh, uh, we've been having uh, uh, over the last uh, few months. And uh, tonight uh, is my turn to talk about uh, uh, caring for aging parents and relationships between uh, children and parents as the parents age. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm gonna base it on the experience I had with my own parents uh, in the 1990s. And I hope people find it uh, useful. So 
Uh, hope to see you tonight, seven. Thank you, John. Also this week is a sharing and listening circle on Zoom, Monday at 10 to 11.30 and an in-person sharing circle this Thursday at 10 a.m. And I know Carolyn wanted to make another announcement. Hi, I'm Carolyn Holstein, and I just wanted to inform everyone that the annual UUCSF Seder will be taking place on Saturday, April 16th at six o'clock. Um, we will be on Zoom again, but we've done it a few years. We're pretty good at it. And I have to say that everyone has really enjoyed it and found it a real bonding experience. And the story of Passover and the Seder is that we celebrate the freedom of the Jewish slaves in Egypt. But as you use, we intertwine this story with freedom for everyone and currently and across history. So we welcome everyone, those who have grown up with the Passover story and those who are brand new to it. And you'll see more information about the Zoom link and how to register um, in this week's weekly bulletin. And also you could always check with me, but please register so that we'll be aware of you and that we will be able to get you the order of service. If you're local, we also deliver um, a basket or a bag of items that you'll need for the Seder. So please let us know and please join us. Thank you. And now uh, Reverend Linda will be giving announcements for the South Nassau UU congregation in Freeport. Good morning, everybody. And I hope all you snookies out there. Um, announcements, more announcements. This is for Freeport, but everyone is invited. Next Sunday service, April 10th, we will be on Zoom, completely on Zoom, and John Berry will lead the service. Mark your calendars for next Friday, April 8th. We'll have our third and final stewardship event. And this one is gonna feature bingo, so you might get rich, never know. And then of course you can donate it all back to Freeport. But come, do come, bring the family, have a good time, and there will be most excellent and wonderful snacks. And if you have not yet made your pledge, please do so. Our goal is 100% participation and we're getting there, but we need you. Pledge materials were sent out by mail, you should have them. And if not, please contact the office and we will send you more. Please fill out the form and either bring it in to Snook or mail it in to Snook or scan it and email it back. And you can also pledge online as well as donate at www.snook.org. And we thank everybody who's already pledged. And finally, check out the news you can use, which arrives in your email on Wednesday for more information on all the happenings. I want to say again, Linda comes to us through the LIAC program to support congregations whose minister is on sabbatical. Um, so it, it's great to have her and it's kind of fun to see the thread that goes through all of our congregations. You can find more information about how to connect to events this week in your e-bulletin and on the events calendar on our website. And you can get announcements that you would like announced to the congregation to our administrator by Tuesday of the week you'd like them announced. If you are visiting, please sign our virtual guest book using the link in the chat. And someone from our Care and Connection team will be in touch with you. Reverend Linda will now read the opening words for lighting the chalice. These are actually opening words that are followed by chalice lighting words. Birth is a beginning and death a destination. And life is a journey from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, 
from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness and back, we pray, to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey from birth to death. So today, as we ponder our journeys, we begin as always with lighting our chalice. These are the words of Elizabeth Stevens. May the lighting of this flame renew in us our endless search for all that is right and true, our abiding love of life and all who share this life, and our unending dedication to following paths of peace and justice. Let us sing if you're on Zoom. We will listen here. The words will be on the screen, hymn number 128, for all that is our life. <laughs> Well, it's good to see you again. It's been a long time since I have been here and stood in this room. Although I did see you on Zoom in January. It's funny about time. It's been at least uh, two years and it feels strange, but it's good to see you. And I hope you're doing well. I'm glad to hear it during Reverend Kimberly's sabbatical. And thank you for having the Freeport Congregation as guests today. The theme this month, as Sue said, is theological reflection, which is pretty ridiculous as a theme in my opinion, <laughs> just, just my opinion. Dr. Wikipedia defines theology as, quote, the systematic study of the nature of the divine and more broadly of religious beliefs. It is taught as an academic discipline, typically in universities and seminaries. It occupies itself with the unique content of analyzing the supernatural, but also deals with religious epistemology 
asks and seeks to answer the question of revelation. Okay, then. That sounds like it could get quite theoretical and philosophical and academic, which is fine. And for those interested in theology, going a little more deeply, there's plenty to study. You might try Unitarian Universalist theologians, James Luther Adams, Rebecca Parker, Tundeika. You might read the work of science fiction writer, Octavia Butler, or take a look at the words of the songs in our hymn books and you will find theological reflection. Is there a Unitarian Universalist theology? Or if the word theology doesn't work for you, is there a Unitarian Universalist religious philosophy? I think there is, I think there is. A foundational theology that's expressed particularly in our first and seventh principles, the worth and dignity of each person and the interconnected web of life. Life is interdependent, we're all part of it. The seventh principle is not only about our connection to the earth, it's about our connection to one another and all the other living beings on the earth. The first principle asserts that in that connection, every person, every person has value. Out of this basic foundation arise the ethics that are expressed in the rest of our principles. With, within this foundation, there's enough room for individual discernment, individual conscience. And thus there are two more, I think, two more foundational pieces to Unitarian Universalist theology. One is our right and our responsibility to define our own beliefs, to build our own theology, to search responsibly for our truth and for meaning. And that is coupled with the importance of aligning our beliefs, aligning our ethical values with how we live our lives. And maybe that's the most important thing of all. Deeds say more about us than creeds. We can say we believe in God or no God, or maybe we have our doubts. We can say we believe in an afterlife or death as a finality, or maybe we're just curious. We can say we believe that human nature is basically good or more good than evil, or the other way around. We can say whatever it is we think we believe, but if our beliefs don't translate into ethical guidelines by which we live, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of our theological reflection? My own theology is a practical one. Whatever I believe, I wanna be able to use as a guide in how I live. The earth is my scripture, poetry is my scripture, interconnection is my scripture. I'm guided by poet Mary Oliver's theological challenge in her poem, The Summer Day. She asks us, who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? That is the theological question. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? How do you want to live in this world? The Japanese painter Hokusai, whose woodblock print of a wave you might have seen, wrote this. Ever since the age of six, I have had a mania for drawing the forms of objects. Towards the age of 50, I published a very large number of drawings 
but I am dissatisfied with everything which I produced before the age of 70. It was at the age of 73 that I mastered the real nature and form of birds, fish, plants, etc. Consequently, at the age of 80, I shall have got to the bottom of things. At 100, I shall have attained a decidedly higher level that I cannot define. And at the age of 110, every dot and every line from my brush will be alive. I call on those who may live as long as I to see if I keep my word. Focus, I live to the age of 90. I don't know if I'll live to the age of 90. All of it kind of makes my head spin. But more importantly, it gives me the opportunity to articulate how I want to live my life. I don't know about you, but most often, I don't know, you know, I simply go about living. I just do it. I give thought to what I'm doing, but not necessarily to the whole picture, to the overall picture. And it's good to step back and look at the overall picture, like a painter when they paint. They paint, they step back, they look at the overall picture. How do I want to live in this world? Psychoanalyst Carl Jung asserted that wholly unprepared, we embark upon the second half of life with the false assumption that our truths and ideals will serve us as before. I don't know if that's so, though I do realize I'm well into the second half of life. I can't kid myself about that anymore. But prepared or unprepared, I find myself wanting to be a bit more intentional. I find myself needing to express how I want to be for the rest of it. I think it's not a bad thing for any of us to consider at any age, how do we want to live our lives? I hold to the theological principle of interconnection. We are connected and dependent upon one another, and I want to live in ways that respect and enhance that. I hold to the theological principle that each living being has inherent worth and dignity, and therefore compassion and understanding are important spiritual values. I hold to what is a theological principle for me, that life is constantly changing and trying to either cling to or push away a given reality that is inherently change brings a lot of suffering. Octavia Butler says it this way, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Therefore, I want to live in the present moment and not run away from it by wanting it to be different. I want to live in the here and now, even knowing that change will come. What is your theological foundation? Serious question. What are the ethics that arise out of your theological foundation? My theological foundation of interconnection, inherent value of living beings, and the nature of life as change leads me to certain ethical values, which is cool, all well and good. But, and how do I make use of this to live in this world? And again, I go to Mary Oliver. This time, the closing lines of her poem in Blackwater Woods. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal. To hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go to let it go. That's the recipe I want to use as I live in this world. So what does it mean exactly? For that, you have to stick around. We support the work of this congregation in many ways. And while we are meeting online and in person, you can still contribute by PayPal or by check. It will show uh, on 
your screen. Um, and for those in the meeting house, we'll be passing around a couple baskets. They're labeled. Um, one is for the work of this congregation. The other is for the Helping Hand Fund, which includes the minister's discretionary fund. And um, those of you from SNOOC can uh, donate as usual with your um, snook.org website. Okay, um, and while we're busy doing this, uh, Abby will be playing The Wind by Cat Stevens. We set aside this time in our service to connect with each other and share um, events, um, hopes, sorrows, concerns uh, with each other. And while we're on Zoom, if you want to be acknowledged, let the tech folks know. Uh, if you're on phone, you can press star six. If you're in the meeting house, um, please come up to this microphone and share, and Pam will be lighting candles for us as we go along. Thanks, Pam. And we will have a time of meditation led by Reverend Linda. Let these words by Stanley Kunitz lead us into a time of meditation <clears throat> and silent prayer. It's called The Layers. I've walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was. Though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind as I am, compelled to look before I can gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon and the slow fires trailing from the abandoned campsites over which the scavenger angels wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made myself a tribe out of my true affections and my tribe is scattered. How shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? In a rising wind, the manic dust of my friends, those who fell along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn, 
I turn, exulting somewhat with my will intact to go wherever I need to go, and every stone on the road precious to me. In my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus-clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt, the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. Thank you, Abby. To love what is mortal. Who do you love? When we love a person, an animal, we think of them as having value, as having worth and dignity. Do we love them because they have worth and dignity? Perhaps we become more aware of their worth and dignity because we love them. To love what is mortal, to love what will die someday, that is no easy task. One of the hardest pieces of this hard task is to love ourselves, our mortal selves, our embodied selves, our bodies. How many of us can say we love our bodies unconditionally? The observation that many of us in our culture with its notions of beauty and fashion and our worship of youth, receive and believe messages, explicit and implicit, those messages that say that our bodies are not good enough. I think it goes even deeper than that. From the Greeks and the Romans, we inherited the idea of the duality of body and mind, spirit and matter. The body dies while the soul lives on. This is a great paradox of Christianity. At Christmas, believers celebrate the word God made flesh, the incarnation of the divine in human form. 
Yet at the same time, from the Christianity of the fourth and fifth centuries, we inherited the idea that everything of the body is sinful. Augustine, perhaps the most influential of all Christian thinkers, wrote that our mortality was punishment for Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. All things mortal, he said, that is to say the body and its desires and its functions are therefore evil and not natural, as Augustine put it. While we live in a religiously pluralistic culture, Christian thought has a strong influence. With this kind of thinking in the religious waters and the cultural waters, so to speak, is it any wonder that we have ambivalence and negativity surrounding our bodies? So given all of this, one of the purposes of today's reflection is to say loudly and clearly, love what is mortal. I do not accept, I will not accept that my body is something inferior. I do not accept, I will not accept that my body is intrinsically sinful or evil or disgusting or not good enough. My body as my life is sacred. It is a theological act to affirm the goodness, the inherent worth and dignity of our bodies, to love what is mortal. To love what is mortal and hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. That means interconnection. That means engaging with life. Yet the challenge to living interconnectedly is our very bodies themselves. Our body is a crucible for molding and shaping our psyche. Our sense of who we are as unique individuals comes first from sensing that we are physically separate from others. A self separated by body boundaries, by skin from other selves. The physical separation we perceive, we live, makes a recognition of interconnection a little bit more tricky. It makes a recognition of interdependence a little bit more frightening. At the same time, the changes that our bodies go through over the course of our lives absolutely highlights our interconnections and our interdependence. I mean, if nothing else, look at the pandemic. We need each other in order to navigate these changes. Over the years, our bodies become walking autobiographies, telling friends and strangers alike of the minor and major stresses of our lives. Our memoirs are written on our bodies. Oh, here's the scar I got when I fell off my bike or when I fell down Mount Everest, depending on how you live. To love what is mortal, and hold it against your bones means paying attention to the care and respect these living autobiographies, all of us, deserve, both our own and the autobiographies of others. Caring and respecting our bodies through all of the changes we go through. When we're children, our bodies change pretty fast. As adolescents, we experience puberty and the changes and the disruption that that brings. As young adults, the changes seem to stabilize, and some of us, not all of us, have a period of adulthood when our bodies pretty much function as we want them to, and then they don't. And then something changes yet again. As we move out of middle age, the changes seem to come faster, and many bring loss. Our strength diminishes, our senses might grow more dull, to love what is mortal and hold it against our bones means we find ways to help ourselves and each other compensate, manage, and or accept the changes. And we cultivate the courage and the skill to do so. And the joy, and the joy. Dylan Thomas has a line in his poem, Fern Hill, that I would want to use as an epitaph, you know, if I was going to have a gravestone, that's what I would want written on it, but I'm not, but I'm telling you anyway, remember it, you know? He wrote this at, at the end of the poem, Fernhill. Time held me green and dying, 
though I sang in my chains like the sea. Yeah, the chains are what holds me to life, to the rhythms and the cycles of life. And all my life, I want to sing in those chains, just like the sea. To love what is mortal. Hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Many read that final line of Mary Oliver's poem and think about death about letting go of the ones we love who have died or letting go of our own life. I certainly think that's in there, but also I experience living as a continual letting go of this and that because change is the truth of life. I think it's important for us to loosen the hold that our insistence on independence has on us, to let go of the myth that we are fully independent that we ever were completely independent, that we must remain independent, that it is a sign of weakness to be dependent on others. The interrelationship between dependence and independence is played out most obviously in our bodies. Through our lives, the balance point between our ability to be physically independent and our need for the help of others continually shifts around. And we have to adjust all the time to that shifting. Young children ride tricycles, and as they get older, they use training wheels on two-wheeled bicycles, and then the training wheels come off, and they get in the car, and they drive away. We bicycle on our own. Then our balance gets a little dodgy, maybe, and maybe we buy an electric bike or one of those adult bicycles, tricycles. And so the circle comes around. In Greek mythology, the Sphinx, that creature half lion, half human, asked Oedipus a riddle. And if he got it right, the Sphinx was going to lift the plague that was destroying the people of Thebes. And if he got it wrong, he would die. The riddle was this. What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening? You probably know the answer. A human being who crawls as a baby, walks on two feet as an adult and uses a cane as an elder. Independence, dependence, continually dancing, shifting in relationship, letting go, holding on, letting go, holding on, letting go. As Stanley Kunitz said in the poem that introduced the meditation, I have walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was. Though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. Live in the layers, not in the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. Theological Reflection Foundations of Unitarian Universalist Theology or Philosophy Interconnection, the worth of every life, freedom of belief and conscience, living the ethical values that arise out of this theology or philosophy. I take these foundations as my own, and to them I add the nature of life as change. And to express this poetically, as we heard Mary Oliver, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things, to love what is mortal, To hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. These are the guideposts that serves me as I abide with Oliver's question. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And so I leave you to your own theological reflection. What are your theological foundations? What are the ethical values that arise out of them for you? And does your life align with them? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, how do you want to live in this world?
may it be so. And a bit of an answer to that is in our hymn, hymn number six, just as long as I have breath. We invite you to remain in the room and join us for informal conversation after this worship is over. As we've been doing, we try to huddle up next to the monitor and include the people from Zoom. Uh, if you are visiting, please sign our virtual guest book using the link in the chat and someone from our Care and Connection team will be in touch with you. If you are visiting for the first time or the 50th time, if you are in agreement with our values, our mission, and our UU principles, we hope you will find a home here. Our benediction will be spoken by Linda. I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it becomes a wing, a torch, a promise. May we all live a meaningful life. May we all not live an unlived life. May it be so. And as we extinguish our chalice, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Amen. Bye. Thank you.
So hello to everyone on Zoom. Hi. Hi. Um, Linda is going to be able to speak to you with the microphone in one second. Um, how is everybody? <laughs> I have a very bad cold, so that's why I'm not sitting there this morning. And I felt bad that Reverend Linda was with us and um, I am oh. not feeling well. So oh. I didn't want to share. <laughs> But I, would to like, be here. I would like to speak with Reverend Linda because every word she spoke went right through and into my heart. And I wonder if this if this service was recorded. I can't hear anything. I, I couldn't hear the Zoom because of the noise in the room. Was the was the service recorded? Uh huh. Um, it should be. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, it should be on YouTube, but I'm not sure. I have to find out. My, Good morning, Uncle. Hello. Hello. Good morning. I I you're in the uh, you're in the now. area. Um, the, the computer is because it's so noisy in the meeting house. So you can see people filing out and you can try yelling at them and maybe, maybe they'll come over and talk to you. Oh, there's <laughs> Tim. Oh, there's 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 Tim. Oh, Hello. Here's Linda. Hi, Linda. I just wanted to tell you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I just wanted to tell you every word you spoke went straight through and into my heart in this time of grieving that I'm going through. And to live a life of purpose after, after I, that's my goal. And I thank, I thank you for your words. So tell me, did did it work in the sanctuary? At Snook, is anybody there in the sanctuary? Yes, we're here. We're here. And, oh, good. It worked. So it worked. There's nine of us here. Okay. Carol, I hope you feel better. Thank you. I'll I'll talk to my doctor tomorrow and get on the Z pack, which always make which always works when I get this. So thank you. Good. I'm functioning. It's just, it's it's fine. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> and Carol, I'm sorry for, fam you know, I uh, I've said to to uh, Marla many times, we we pick friends, but we 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 don't pick our family. They're just we're we're give they're given to us and we're given to them by no choice of our own. But we, yes, and but we pick our friends, and our friends become our family mm -hmm. if our family just isn't there for us. And uh, it's not an unusual thing that family just isn't there. So, mm -hmm. but we love you dearly, and we love your ethics. I'm really so, sorry to you too. Right, <laughs> I love you too. I, I understand too. where that comes from, and I'm very relieved to know that. There is a source of love, even though it is not my family. Right. There you go. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful. Does love no family? Ah, oh, sanctuary. Um, love's love. I don't think it takes a part of something. Wow. Um, yeah, that's pretty deep. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to say goodbye, folks. It was a great service. I love you all. Mwah. Thank you.
But, uh, love you all. That was a great, great service. Love the poem. I'll be looking that up. I, I will see you next Sunday. Have a great week, everybody. Okay. You too. I'm going to head out. See ya. Hey, Barbara. Just shouting out to you, girl. Here to I thank you, Lisa. Thanks, babe. See you next week. Okay, remember that. I wonder who is in the sanctuary. Can you tell me? Here is something. Debbie, you heard is what you needed to hear. <laughs> hey, Barbara. It's um, Andrew, Joel, yeah. Mark, Joanne, Charlotte, Bernetti, <laughs> and Bernetti and me. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks for thanks for being there. <laughs> You think she dropped off? All right, Kristen, I see you. <laughs> hey, Lisa. Is that Mark? Hi, hi, everybody. Oh. <laughs> there we are. Okay. <laughs> are we? The, you're the next. Gotta get the Bernetti's. There they are. You see them? Hello, waving? little Snookies. Okay. Hi, Snookies <laughs> at Snook. All nine of us. Have a great day. I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs> Me too. Bye. Bye, guys. Hi, Mark. I see you. Bye, Lisa. <laughs> Bye. Have a great day, guys. Love y'all. Oh. I don't know. I was trying to find my sister and she rocked off. So I don't know. Uh, no, she's still here. Okay. All right. So now you can join us. We're just a little bit.